I read somewhere that sometime in the 1940s, a book came out in the United States of America called Baby and Child Care, written by Dr. Benjamin Spock. That became the standard book for all parents of that period to bring up their children, and he said, don't discipline your children. The result was seen in the 1960s when all the children became hippies, lots of them, rebellious. Such a thing had never happened in the United States for so many years. I read this somewhere, it's not my research, but I read this somewhere. The influence of the teaching of one man whose book was accepted as standard. No, 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 we don't discipline our children. There are better ways, negotiate and negotiate. What are they, business partners or something that you negotiate with them? <clears throat> they neglected God's word and they reaped the consequences. Well, thankfully that book was not circulated much in India. But it says, what son is there whom his father does not discipline? It's because you love, and whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. If you love your child, you will correct him and discipline him. And because even God put man under law before he brought him under grace. And law involved punishment. Have you heard the story of the carrot and the stick? The carrot and the stick means the way to get a donkey to move forward is Hold a carrot in front of him, the donkey will keep going. If he doesn't move, use a stick behind him, he'll move forward. It's a carrot and the stick. And this is the same principle with which we bring up children. Offer them a reward or punish them. And that is how God brought up Israel under the law. If you obey me, I'll give you this, 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 this. If you don't obey me, I'll punish you with this, 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 this. It was a carrot and the stick. You can't be better than God. And children are under the law in their younger days. They are not under grace. They haven't come to the life of walking in the spirit. And any person who is not walking in the spirit is under law, even if he's 50 years old. If you're not filled with the spirit, my brother, sister, even if you're 100 years old, please be under the law. Otherwise, you'll live a life more wicked than Old Testament people. The law, every man who does not walk in the spirit must be under the law. And children do not know what it is to be in, in the spirit. And therefore, they have to be kept under the law and the law has a carrot and a stick. You read in the Old Testament. Go to Deuteronomy 28. It's very clear. So which son is there whom his father does not discipline? And listen to this. Verse 8. If you are without discipline, which all children become partakers, then you're not really, chill, then you're not really God's sons. You're illegitimate. You're an illegitimate child if God doesn't discipline you. Furthermore, verse 9. We had earthly fathers to discipline us. That was universal in the first century. All fathers disciplined their children. And we respected them. Yeah, one day your child will respect you. If you <clears throat> discipline them, and we, shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live. Further, verse 10. Holy fathers disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. That means we don't do it perfectly. That also is recognized in scripture. We don't do it perfectly because we are not perfect. But God, who is perfect, disciplines us perfectly. All discipline, whether we give to our children or God gives to us, verse 11, does not seem to be joyful. No child appreciates a spanking. It is very painful. And when God disciplines us also, it's painful. If you're disciplined in the church, it is painful. But to those who don't get offended by it, those who are trained by it, not everybody, those who allow that discipline to work in their life, afterwards it will produce peace and righteousness. So, <clears throat> fathers, don't be discouraged. I want to read something to you which, uh, if I can find it, um, about how Uh, you know, people consider their fathers. 
somebody wrote this. At age four, the child says, my daddy can do anything. When he's seven years, uh, he says, my daddy knows quite a bit. When he's nine years old, he says, well, dad doesn't really know everything. When he's 12 years old, he says, dad doesn't understand. When he's 14 years old, he says, dad is old fashioned. When he's 21 years old, he says, boy, my dad is completely out of touch with reality. When he's 25 years old and he's close to getting married, yeah, I think dad's okay. <laughs> when he's 30 years old, he says, I wonder what dad thinks about this. I'd like to know. <laughs> when he's 35, he says, I'd like to get my dad's opinion on this matter. When he's 50 years old, he thinks, what would my dad have done in this situation? What would he have thought of it? And when he's 60, well, my dad's not alive. I wish he were here. I could talk it, talk it over with him. So don't get discouraged if they are at different stages and say different things. They'll change their mind as they grow older. <laughs> okay. Uh, don't get discouraged if your children don't appreciate what you're doing for them right now. One day afterwards, it'll produce results that you'll be thankful for. Your children will thank you for the discipline, the correction, the strictness that you had at home concerning time when they should come back, certain things you are not allowed them to do. You did not give them in indefinite amount of money for them to spend as they like. You did not buy certain things because you said, son, we can't afford that in our home. You taught them to live with simple, simply and be frugal in the way they lived. It will help them in the long run. Your children will not get into debt when they set up a home because they saw in your home you never bought anything that you couldn't afford. I've seen a lot of people, as soon as they get married, they get into debt. They get married, and they get into debt from the time of their wedding. Not at all a good testimony. If you ha that happened to you, repent. And don't let your children see parents who are in debt. It's not a good testimony. Cut down your expenditure. Let, let them see how you live at home, how you use money carefully, that money doesn't grow on trees that you can just get it and spend it as you like and especially if you're a very rich person and you earn a lot of money oh boy you really need to be careful that you don't spoil your children by giving them everything they want everything you can afford it's not wise it's not good it's good for children to learn to work and not have everything done for them it's good to have children to learn to struggle a little bit that'll make them tough to do work around the house and to, and I believe, you know, in India, how important it is for children to get an education. I believe that's one of the great things. Indian parents excel. I think they are some of the best parents in the world as far as this is concerned, that they really take seriously their children's education. I've seen a lot of Western homes where the parents don't even seem to bother whether children are educated or not. And those children grow up later on and struggle, struggle, struggle. Financially, they get into debt and there are hardships because their parents never said, listen, we want to give you a good education. I've, I was recently seeing uh, a little life story video of this uh, black young African-American boy in America who grew up in a slum, in a ghetto as they call it, with all bad friends and his, I think his father had left him, his, only his mother was bringing up and you know, fights and quarrels, he almost killed somebody, etc. But his mother was determined to give him an education and uh, worked hard and encouraged him and encouraged him. And by the time he was around 32 years old, he became the top children's neurosurgeon in a, one of America's top hospitals doing unique operations. It's an amazing story. And it was due to a mother who was determined to give her son a good education. You know, that's, I believe that's something that parents need to take care of, that we uh, allow our children to uh, be able to stand on their own feet when they come of age, that we encourage them, and therefore it's important that uh, parents take time to sit with their children, to do their homework, 
to teach them the subjects that are difficult for them to understand or get help for them. It's very important. I mean, it may mean effort, it may mean money, it may mean sacrifice. But when your children are one day standing on their own feet, they'll thank you for it. We've got to live for our children as parents. That's the mark of a good father and mother, that you don't just think of yourself. You know, a good father and mother will always make sure that children get good food. If they can't afford good food for everybody, they'll deny themselves and make their children have good food. In the same way, we want to have it good for our children, give them a good education so that they can be established on their own feet. They don't appreciate the value of education when they're 13, 14 years old. They may want to play the fool and because they don't appreciate it enough. But we who are older and we've lived in the world, we know <clears throat> how that's important for them um, to, if it's only a good education that will enable them to get a good salary later on and be able to earn their own living so that they are not a, dependent on others and they can stand on their own feet. And there's a certain dignity that comes about them when they can stand on their own feet. And even spiritually, it helps them when they know that they're not having to constantly struggle because their parents ignored their education. I've come across a number of cases like that of parents who couldn't care less for their children and I've seen those children suffer, 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 suffer. Please, uh, we see it's unfortunate. Some of them, their parents were not believers, they were godless and um, uh, they, such children can only forgive their parents. They were ignorant. Forgive them for they don't know what they did. But we need to learn lessons from that. And I want to say to you parents, don't get so busy with your work that you neglect your children. And not just education. I want to show you a verse in Malachi chapter 4. In Malachi chapter 4 we read this verse that we already saw. In the last days, the Lord will send someone, the last verse of the Old Testament says, the Lord will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children through his servants and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, he will come and smite the land with a curse. You know what is the great need in the last days in the world? He's speaking about the great and dread, terrible day of the Lord, verse 5. And we are approaching that great and terrible day of the Lord when the world will be judged. And the church, as I said in verse 5, is to come in the spirit of Elijah and John the Baptist. And what are we to proclaim? The missing message. We need fathers. In the church, we need spiritual fathers. We don't need directors, superintendents. Certainly, we don't need dictators. We need fathers in the church. Fathers who will sacrifice time, energy for the sake of their flock and who will discipline their flock just like you do at home. And in the home, we need fathers. Not a word is said here about mothers. Fathers, just like the husband is the leader of the home, the father must lead his children to teach them the scriptures. Don't leave that to the Sunday school. No, I never left the teaching of scripture to the Sunday school. My children attended Sunday school here from childhood. But I said, that's not the place. I'm not going to let the Sunday school teachers take the responsibility. I have to make sure, first of all, that they know the facts of the Bible. So I used to get them a Bible storybook that they would be encouraged to read with pictures and all that so that they would know the facts of the Bible. I don't have to instruct them all. If they themselves read it, that's great. But then the principles of the Bible, I have to teach them. And we would talk about it at different times. And my wife was particularly careful whenever the children came back from school to talk to them, I think, every single day. How was your day at school? I wasn't often at home. I was traveling so much in the preaching of the gospel. But how was your day? And then you discover so many things that happened in school. Maybe they picked up some bad words in school. I remember one of my children once, I don't even remember who it was, and I don't want to try and remember who it was, <laughs> uh, used a bad word. <laughs> I don't know, I was six or seven years old. I knew he didn't even know the meaning of it <laughs> because we never used it at home. So uh, I laughed inwardly and I said, do you know the meaning of that word? He says, no, somebody used it in school. I said, please, I'm not going to explain the meaning of the word to you, <laughs> but it's a bad word. Don't ever use it again. And I never heard him use it again. You can't blame the child. They're surrounded by people who are doing all types of wicked things in school. You've got to 
just like you give them a shower or a bath when they come home, you got to give them an inward shower or bath from the habits they have picked up from school. Who's going to teach them that if somebody steals your pencil in the kindergarten, you should not steal somebody else's pencil? You know that as an adult, but a child's logic is, hey, somebody stole my pencil. Ah, oh, I see a pencil there. Let me take it. And they come home with somebody else's pencil. Do you check their bags when they come home? <laughs> and they'll tell you, well, somebody stole my pencil, mommy. So I stole somebody else's. A child's logic, that's correct. But you say, no, we are Christians. Please go back tomorrow and return that pencil to the teacher and say, I found somebody's pencil, here it is. I'll give you another pencil. Don't, don't worry. As when you're children, people will steal all types of things of yours. We'll replace it. <laughs> uh, don't worry, but don't ever touch another person's property. You know, even in, when they're 12th standard, one friend of mine, one of my children came to my house and stole his calculator. Okay, forget it. And my children are so loyal to their friends that till today they never told me who stole it because they got it back finally, but they wouldn't tell me till today who did it. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate their loyalty to their friends. My point is this. Children don't know many things. We have to teach them. Don't assume that they know. They don't know. You're supposed to teach them. Little, little things. Now, I'm not saying we, my wife and I did it perfectly. We made many mistakes, but we would go to James chapter 1, verse 5 always. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. That's my favorite verse for parents. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him go to God. And boy, we lacked wisdom. Lord, give us wisdom. And I believe that if we live in humble dependence on God and we try to honor God in our home, even if we do 101 wrong things like I did, like my wife did, and like all of you will do, God will still make it go well with our children because deep down in our heart, our desire was to do his will. Our desire was that our home should honor God. And if your desire is that, God will help you.